think everyone here was at the last one, so everyone should have an account. And uh, just like last time, we'll go ahead and search for Claire. Oh my lord, Claire Heinbaugh, which should she should be the only Claire Heinbaugh here with a nice little DSC logo. Um, and once we're here, we'll bop over to notebooks. Scroll down, we'll see the the, the public notebooks for DSC. And we will go to student, although it's worth noting, um, we have also the instructor version, which is completely filled in, um, which, which uh, you know, if you fall behind, you know, take a look at this. This has kind of what the solutions are, um, or after the fact, if you want to fill it in, this uh, has the solutions. And if we don't get through all of it, definitely, you know, we'll share this and make sure that this is out there. Um, and we're recording. So we can definitely put this up on the YouTube and, you know, uh, on the YouTube page and people who weren't able to make it can check it out uh, in, in that asynchronous format. So we will go to the uh, sociology history linguistics lesson and we will click copy and edit. Take a second uh, to boot up the session. Um, but we should then um, see that we have our clean notebook, right? We've copied uh, the notebook there and we have our own um, copy to be, to be working with. You can rename it um, if you'd like. Uh, I won't. So uh, we're in Kaggle. We have this kind of environment. Uh, it's a little strange if you're not used to the notebook format, uh, but the most important things is we're dealing with some files over here that I've included as part of the notebook. Uh, and this is where everything will be outputted. This is our output directory, uh, and this is called our input directory. Uh, so we have text files. And if we click on these, uh, we can see the names of all these different text files. They're .txt files, so they're just plain text. Uh, and it's actually 21 blogs um, that are collected in, oh gosh, it's like the British, uh, British English Language Corpus or something like that. Uh, that's where I pulled it from. I can share that link after the fact. Uh, but we have 21 blog posts. I thought this was, would be kind of a, a, a you know a cool uh, corpus of text to approach for uh, this lesson. So lesson goals. The idea is we want to be able to read in some text data into Python here into our environment. Uh, we're going to use a heck of a lot of libraries, um, right? Uh, a lot of this stuff, you know, people have already solved these problems. You know, why reinvent the wheel? Uh, so we will leverage a lot of libraries that will make the coding process uh, a whole lot easier. Uh, and then we're going to use some very basic uh, natural language processing, NLP is what I call it, or what people generally call it. Uh, but it's natural language processing uh, techniques to extract some key information um, about these blog posts that we have. And the final product hopefully we get here uh, is this nice little, um, this nice little plot uh, where we can see kind of these, uh, you know, these phrases, right? May 2010, these uh, phrases that kind of co-occurred at high frequency uh, and we can see the count uh, in a given blog. So hopefully we get here, this is a nice little result and definitely it's really easy. The code is really easy to kind of manipulate and extend uh, so that you can make other cool visualizations with, uh, with this data. Libraries, I, got a, I have a lot of description uh, and this will be nice if you come back and you're trying to come back to it like after the fact um, or you're trying to follow along on your own. Uh, you can read along through this description, but it's basically what I'm going to say. Uh, we're going to bring in a bunch of libraries and I've already done this for you. There's nothing to fill in here, um, but pandas is a data manipulation library. It's really nice for what we call rectangular data. Um, it's in a tabular format, right? So we have uh, variables and columns. Right, so we have these columns and we have rows. Rows are our observations uh, and the columns are what we call variables. We bring in a bunch of different stuff from NLTK. Um, NLTK is the natural language toolkit. It's a very comprehensive uh, library for, for natural language processing in Python. Um, and it, it implements a lot of different things that we're gonna use, right? So from uh, the corpora uh, you know, in NLTK, we'll bring in stop words from, from you know, this grouping of functions, we're going to bring in this function uh, and so on. Uh, we bring in a couple of libraries that actually uh, ship with base Python. 
So string, collections, glob, CSV, these are gonna make it a little easier to interact with some of the different things. Uh, we won't have to implement them ourselves, we'll just leverage these libraries. And then we have a couple of plotting libraries, matplotlib and seaborn. So you are going to go ahead and run this cell, make sure that we bring in all the requisite uh, libraries or else the code won't run later on. If you get uh, you know, an error later on that's like, you know, what is this library? What is pandas or what is, uh, you know, what are these different things that we're bringing in? It's probably because you forgot to run this. So really make sure that that runs. It should take a moment. Uh, and then once the, you know, square goes away here, it's run. Um, and uh, I have some extra information about the libraries if you want to check out the documentation uh, later. Definitely, uh, if you want to look at anything, Pandas uh, has really nice documentation, really has a lot of tutorials. It's, it's, it's well documented. And Pandas is a really good library to uh, uh, read up on. Uh, I have a couple of additional elements here. You're just going to want to run these. You don't have to interact with these in any meaningful way. Um, I wrote a, a function here that's going to wrap something from NLTK. There's a, a there's a function in NLTK we want to use, but it doesn't quite do what I want it to do for this lesson. So I, I just I change it a little bit. You don't need to worry about it. We'll use this, but uh, no real reason to worry about it right now. We'll talk about it when we do get to it. So make sure to run that. Uh, make sure that it does run, that you don't get any output here, right? I didn't ask it for any output. I just told it, please define this function for me. Python does that. The function exists in our working space right now, uh, but we don't need to really worry about it. And the last thing I have here uh, won't make sense now. It won't make sense until we start talking about some pre-processing, uh, but go ahead and run it and I'll come back to this later. So this first section uh, is reading in test files. So make sure you've run these initial three cells. That's pretty important. Uh, you can see if they've run, right? They'll have a little number here that shows the order in which they've been run. Um, so we can see all the three of them have been run. That's important. They'll be important later on and you'll get weird errors if you don't run those. Um, so this first section is very simple. We're just gonna read in the data. And the data is over here. Just because we have it in our Kaggle environment um, doesn't mean that we have it actually in this Python environment in any meaningful way that we can actually uh, interact with. Right, it's important that we have it in a very specific format uh, or else Python will get really angry with us. So, um, in order to have it uh, in this correct format, oh, Pinar just joined. Uh, Pinar, we just uh, basically navigated to uh, Kaggle, looked up Claire Heinbaugh, and then made a copy of this sociology student version. Uh, and so we just started, so ho hopefully you're able to catch up a little bit. Um, but we've run those initial cells, and now we're going to bring in the data. The first thing, you don't change anything about this cell. We'll just run it and make sure that you kind of see a bunch of these text files, right? This right here, the idea is that we're using this as validation. We want to make sure we see these text files in our environment. If we don't, there's a real problem. You shouldn't have a problem here. Um, because you copied my notebook and I included these text files as additional material, you shouldn't have a problem with that cell. So, right, run that cell, make sure that you get this output. Uh, it doesn't need to be exactly this, but make sure you do get an output that is important. Uh, moving along, this is this is just kind of this one here is really just uh, a quirk of Kaggle. You have to kind of uh, be a little extra careful because Kaggle is a little strange about how it deals with its environment. Um, you'll see kind of how I have this set up though. This is the first cell that we're actually going to edit and I have some, uh, you know, additional information here. Um, but uh, what we want to do is anywhere there's a to do, right, a comment that has to do right on that line, we're gonna need to change something. So we're gonna need to fill this in, right? String, it doesn't mean anything right now. We need to put in our own string. So go ahead and create a string. And um, this is a little complicated, but we'll go, the string is um, what we call a file path. It's gonna show us how to get to this directory over here to grab these text files. Uh, and so what we'll do is go Kaggle uh, and make sure that these are backslashes, not forward slashes. We'll go to input. Right, we see that we need to be over an input. And then we'll go to text files. We can see that this thing right here is named text files. This last bit uh, is a little particular to what glob is doing. It's gonna, we're gonna give it a pattern to match, right? So we're gonna go star and then dot txt, 
right? So this is our completed string. And what we're telling you is navigate to Kaggle input over here, navigate specifically to this directory, text files, uh, and then pull anything, right? This wild card, pull anything essentially that ends with a .txt. And we'll see that that's actually all of our files. So we'll match all of our files. Um, and I'll, I'll keep this on screen, right? Because this is a little, a little confusing, but make sure that you have your backslashes and that you include this asterisk. Uh, when you run this, you shouldn't have any problems. It should save that variable file names. Uh, and then to validate, right, that this worked correctly, we can go ahead and add right to the left of this to-do statement. We'll go ahead and add print, oops, print file names, right? We're just gonna print this variable, make sure that we captured the, uh, captured the correct files. Uh, and we run this cell, we should see a list, right? That's what the square brackets indicate. So you should see a list of all of the different files that we have, right? There's file one, there's file two. We did correctly kind of capture these files over here, right? So now we have the file paths. We say, this is how you can get to uh, all these different files. So we've told it, we have, we have this collection. We told it how to get to these files. Um, we're now gonna leverage these file names that we've grabbed, right? We're gonna go through them and ho hopefully everyone's uh, doing okay, but we're gonna go through them here, right? Uh, and we're gonna do an operation for each one of them, right? That's we're gonna use a for loop here. And we're gonna do something for each one of these file paths. We'll go in, we'll use that file path, we'll open up the file, take the text, read it into Python as a string, and then save that. Uh, and we're specifically gonna save it into this, uh, this, this uh, list here. It's an empty list, but we're gonna populate it right, with each one of the files uh, in its string representation. So we're gonna go ahead and delete this pass statement here. And make sure you're indented. We need to be inside this with statement. Um, so we'll make sure that we're uh, properly indented here. There we are. Um, and we'll go ahead and fill in with file strings, right, strs dot append, we're gonna tell it to stick something on the end. Append is placing it at the end of this list. And make sure that you match this to this, right? We're trying to stick it into this list. Uh, so these names have to match. What are we appending? We're gonna append, uh, essentially what we're doing is we're going through each one of these, opening them up, right? And then we need to read the contents in each of the files, right? So we'll go file.read. Uh, and it's important that you use specifically a dot here. What this is saying is from this file object, we're gonna use this method that belongs to the file object uh, to pull out, pull out that text data. Uh, and we know that these are .txt files, so we can pull them out as strings, right? So the completed statement here is, iteratively add each one of the files, right? Using append, uh, we'll iteratively add the string representations to our list. And if you have that complete statement, we'll go ahead and fill in, right? We have a to-do here. We'll fill in with a nice little print statement for, um, for validation sake. And you're kind of seeing uh, my own style here for coding. I like checking each step of the way, right? That it worked. I think this notebook format is really nice for that. You get to kind of check things uh, without having to uh, worry too much about your output getting really complicated, right? So then all we'll do is print the length of file strings, right? Oops, we're gonna wanna make sure that file strings is inside of that length, right? So we'll print length of file strings. If we run this um, block now, we should get 21. There are 21 blog posts over here. Uh, we should get 21. Uh, if you're having problems, um, you know, it's a small enough group that go ahead and speak up or, um, oh, and I forgot to talk about this, uh, but hopefully it was put in the chat at some point that if you're having any problems, you can uh, email. Um, Claire, would you mind throwing that in the chat if you haven't yet? Put it in. Okay, good. Sorry about that. Uh, if you're having problems, go ahead and email that email um, and just take a screenshot. 
uh, and they should, uh, Claire and Sasan should be able to help you out, right? But so at this point, we filled in this block. We have supposedly read in all of our files and they've been, they've been captured in this file strings list. And we have 21 files, right? Or the length here is 21. So we have 21 different strings representing uh, each one of these files. So we finally pull it into Python. Uh, and, and then a good thing here now to do, and this is actually quite important, is make sure they came in exactly as you expected. So we're going to print out a, a little bit more. We want a little bit more information than just we have 21 files. We want to make sure those files look exactly like we want them to, right? So let's look at file strings. We're going to index it. We're going to look at the very first uh, element of file strings, right? So we're zero indexing in Python. That means that the first element is at zero instead of one. And from that first element, we're going to further index. We're going to go from zero to 500. What does that mean? We want the first 500 characters of the string, right? So uh, the, the string is some large character representation, and we want just maybe the first 500 characters, just to make sure that it actually does look like we expect it to. Um, and what we should see, if we do that, is the very beginning of what looks like a blog post. And we'll notice that there's some um, spacing stuff, right? We have these new line characters, um, but it does look like we would expect. It actually looks like uh, a blog post as a title. Um, and, then it, and then it goes to the content of the blog. So uh, what we should see when we, when we look at file strings, when we look at the first blog, and we look at the first five I characters, we should look, see something uh, that, that makes a lot of sense here. Um, it's possible that your files got flipped around and you're looking at a different blog instead of uh, you know this fermentation, the daily wine blog. Um, I don't think that's likely, but don't worry if you see a different blog, nothing here changes. It just means that something got flipped around for you uh, and you're seeing something slightly different than me. As long as you see something that looks like a blog, you're doing really well. Um, so we have one last thing to do for pulling in the files. Um, and this one's a little, uh, you know, was it? Oh, yeah, yeah. No, I'm pausing just in a moment. Um, but th this one uh, may not be as interesting um, for other people, uh, right? But th this is kind of a choice. I'm going to stick all the strings together. Um, and I think the interesting thing here is, right, we can do analysis blog by blog um, and then compare blogs, you know we analyze the text and then we compare, or we can stick them all together and see if um, we start to see trends across blogs. And, and to stick them all together, we'll create a variable, all blogs, right? Creating a variable, we have an equal sign is to the left of the equal sign. This is what we want it to be called. And we're gonna go ahead uh, and say, with a new line character, I'd like for you to join uh, file strings. What does this do? Well, file strings is a list. It's going to take each element of the list, join it together using a new line character. That's just like an enter or a return on the keyboard. Uh, and then once you've done that, right, once they're all in one string separated by new line characters, save that as all blogs, right? That should run. You shouldn't have any output. So that's all we did uh, really to bring stuff in, right? We we uh, checked that we have, you know, kind of the right files in our working space. Uh, we did this glob statement that was a little strange, but it essentially captured all the necessary file paths. We made sure that we had the right file paths, and we did, and matched what was over here. Um, after we made sure we had the right file paths, we uh, opened each one of them and saved it to our file strings, which we'll be coming back to again and again. Uh, and we made sure we had the right amount of them. It should have been 21. Uh, we looked at the first one, the first 500 characters of the first blog. And then we joined them all together. Uh, and this, this is really kind of an analysis choice. You don't really need to do this. Um, but th this, this might be interesting to someone as they start kind of thinking, uh, how do blogs compare maybe to other texts? I would want to try to aggregate that data and look across blogs rather than blog by blog. So I'll pause. If anyone's really lost, make sure to e uh, email that uh, email in the chat. Uh, are there any like general questions right now at this step?
And just in mute, you don't need to raise your hand, just in mute, it's a pretty small group. All questions are allowed. There are no smooth brain questions. <laughs> if there are no questions, I'm gonna move along. I'll give it just a second more. Um, if there's a, you know, a code block you want me to go back to just so you can finish writing the code, just let me know right now. I can go back to it, but if there's no one who wants any of those things, everyone is very satisfied, then we can move along. Oh, could I ask a question actually? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so um, I noticed, so in, in the in the kind of the code block we're in right now, where you print the first 500 characters, I noticed that there's like spacing between, the, for example, like the Daily Wine blog and Eminent Domain. Is that due to like new line characters? Yeah, essentially what they've done is if we look at the TXT file, we have maybe Right. We have three new lines here, so maybe we just have three new line characters. Stuck okay. the end. If we wanted to get rid of that really easy in Python, we could use something uh, like um, split and then join it back together, or we could strip them out. Uh, we could use regular expressions if you really wanted to, but um, maybe you don't because regular expressions are difficult. <laughs> um, yeah, no, yeah, absolutely. And, and, and that might be something you do want to fix, right, in pre-processing. I don't think I do anything to it because it doesn't mess up what we're going to do. Um, but that, depending on your analysis, that might be something you want to deal with. Um, also, Thank so you. No worries. Uh, just email us and we can send you the parts of the code that you missed, Hassan or I can, um, if you'd like to catch up. I know we have some people who might want to. All right. I'm going to move along. I think this is one of the coolest parts. I like pre-processing, which is uh, kind of bland, um, but uh, I, think it's, I think it's pretty cool. I think pre-processing is probably the most important step here. Uh, and in almost any uh, data science procedure, it's probably the most important step. Uh, so natural language processing, you wanna make sure your data looks exactly like, uh, kind of exactly in the, it needs to be in exactly the, des the desired format. Um, if you're trying to do a certain type of analysis that would require the data to look uh, in a certain way, and then you give it something that looks wrong, you're gonna get something that's nonsense or will completely error out on you. So you really wanna make sure you do the correct pre-processing. Our pre-processing is gonna use a couple of really classic uh, NLP tools, right? And those three are tokenization, normalizing case, and removing stop words. So tokenization, I, I provided an example before we uh, go to any one of these. I wanna make sure that we kind of have an idea of what this looks like before we try it out on our real data. Right, so I have this string A, it's just a little sentence. Not, it's pretty much nonsense, um, but it's good for showing us what tokenization does, right? So we have this function to word tokenize. That's from NLTK, the Natural Language Toolkit, which is one of the uh, libraries that we brought in at the beginning. All right, and we're gonna replace string here, right? There's a to-do statement. Uh, so we're gonna we're gonna go ahead and replace replace that string with string A, right? We want to tokenize this string. What does tokenization do for us? If we run this cell, we'll see that essentially our string has been turned into a list where each part of the list, uh, each element of the list, is a constituent element uh, of the string. And it's not just as simple as turn it into the words, right? We see punctuation is considered its own token. Uh, we see uh, we see some more complicated things too, and this is this kind of gets into uh, some design choices. But we see that do, and then this n apostrophe t gets split into two different words, um, and that's a design choice, right? If we didn't want that to happen, maybe we'd write our own tokenization algorithm or function. But that's how um, word tokenized from NLTK decides to tokenize, right? So we kind of see what happens with tokenization. We've been split into our constituent elements. Um, and it's nice because this is a really good, nice basic unit of analysis uh, later on for, for a lot of NLP uh, analyses. Um, we'll move along, normalizing case. This one's really intuitive, right? We have a word, hello, uh, and we have also hello in string C, right? String B and C are the same word. Because of this capital H, Python's gonna be really picky and tell us that these are two different words, which is intuitively not correct, right? With a word like hello, we don't wanna differentiate uh, hello with a capital H or hello with a, you know, with a lowercase h. If someone happened to stick 
you know, a capital L in there, it still should be the same word. Um, so when we do our analysis, and this is another design choice, right? Because if, you know, we would lose information when we normalize case, right? Apple, the company capitalizes the A versus Apple, you know, the, the red object that you would eat uh, does not capitalize the A. You lose information if you normalize case there. So sometimes it does matter. In our uh, scenario here, we're, we're, we're making the simplifying assumption that it really won't matter that much. Um, and you can relax that assumption and do more, uh, you know, more refined things. Um, but, but we're going to go ahead and say that these are the same word. Um, so if we run this block, there's nothing to fill in here. If we run this block, we see that uh, as they are string B and C, are they equal, right? With this equal, equal, are they the same? No, they're not the same. But if we go string B dot lower, right? We say we have this string object, string B, and we want to make it all lowercase. We just go dot lower. Um, and if we do that to both strings, then we see, right, we print it out. We see that we get a true. Yes, they are now equal. Python considers them equal. That'll be important when we're putting together counts for words, right? If we count the number of hellos and these two are different words, we'd be a little sad. Uh, we're not doing analysis where it matters that uh, those are different words. And so the last step here is probably the least intuitive, right? It's called stop words. Stop words uh, are these words that are not really indicative of the text that you're looking at. Um, if I look at any text, I'm going to see a lot of any English text. I'll see a lot of, you know, A's, right? Or these or uh, ors, you know, I'll see a lot of these different words that the text share uh, that are just in, in, in abundance. Um, and they don't tell anything, tell me anything about the text. We'd like to remove those. So stop words, right? This is something we brought in from NLTK and we're telling it we want English words, right? So this is a corpus from NLTK that we're now gonna leverage. It's a corpus, it's a collection of words. We're gonna leverage it and we're gonna just go ahead and check out, you know, what are these words that they're deciding to call stop words. Um, so we'll go ahead and put bounds in here, right? We're gonna slice it. We'll look at from zero to 10. What are the first 10 stop words uh, in NLTK's English stop words corpus, right? It's I, me, my, myself. These words are not particularly indicative of a certain text. Uh, a text about firefighting, a text about cats would both, you know, share these words uh, in abundance. And so they're not particularly interesting. We want them to go. We want them gone. So we have our three elements, right? We have uh, pre-processing, we have tokenization, we have normalizing case, and we have removing stop words. And we have a very basic understanding of what, e what each of those is gonna do for us. We're gonna define a function, right? That's gonna take in a string. It's gonna take in some desired stop words. Uh, and then it's gonna apply our pre-processing. It's gonna normalize case on this line. It's gonna tokenize. And then it's gonna remove our stop words. Uh, and this is gonna be nice, right? We define as a function here um, but we could make it arbitrarily complicated. We could add in different elements of pre-processing. As long as it's in this function, we can then apply it whenever we want. We can update and it'll be easily applicable. It's much nicer than repeating this code over and over and over again. Right, so the method that we're gonna fill in here on this capital method, there's a to-do, so we need to replace something. We'll go ahead and just stick lower, right? We wanna normalize case to begin with. That's the first thing we wanna do. Next, we have a to-do on the next line too, right? What's the next thing that we wanna do? Well, we wanna stick a function in here and that's word tokenize, right? And with word tokenize, we give it our lowercase string, right? We pass that to the function and it's gonna give us back a list of tokens, right? And we're gonna save that in string tokens. So we passed it, right? We've give, we made it lowercase, we've tokenized it. After we do that, uh, you know, removing the stop words, a little bit more complicated. We'll create an empty list that's going to hold our final tokens. Those are the non-stop word tokens. And then we'll go with a for loop. We're going to iterate through the tokens that we currently have, which is just string tokens, right? str underscore tokens. Uh, and we're going to do something, right? For each token, we're going to look at it and we're going to say, is this a stop word? Is it in my collection of stop words? If it's not, 
keep it. If it is, we don't want it. Get it out of there. Right? So let's replace this pass. And to replace this pass, we're going to go ahead and say, if the token that I'm looking at is not in the stop words that you passed to me, right? We gave it some stop words and we're looking at tokens. If the token's not in the stop word list, right, we're good. Let's stick that in our file tokens, right? With the file tokens that append, we'll stick it on the end. And we're gonna stick on that token that we're looking at. So the token passes the test, it's not in the stop words. Please put it in my final tokens. And at the end, right, we'll just, let's, let's go ahead and uh, do the last to do here in this function. Then we'll like talk about it a little bit more just to make sure that we have this uh, all set to go. We'll go ahead and return out those final tokens, right? So this is uh, the list of tokens uh, that doesn't contain stop words. It's been normalized by case and they're tokens. They're not just one long arbitrary string that's hard to analyze. They're broken up into easy to analyze chunks, right, into our tokens. So this, this block here, this cell, had a lot of different things that we had to do, right? Uh, a little complicated. We'll stop here for a second. Make sure it runs. If it does, it's gonna stick this function into what we call our namespace. It exists and it's waiting for us to use it, right? We've told it that this function exists uh, and we'll use it later on. But we'll stop here for a second, make sure that everything runs well. This is one of the more complicated blocks. Uh, so I really wanna make sure that we are able to uh, define our pre-processing. And if there are any questions, um, shout them out now. If you were wondering what I was doing, you know, no stupid questions, ask them. Um, yeah. So we'll stop here for a, a, you know, a minute. Um, if no one has questions, I'll probably just ramble. <laughs> and go ahead and give me a thumbs up uh, if, if you're, you're doing okay here. You can, uh, yeah, just thumbs up on your, uh, you know, on your screen or do a thumbs up little emoticon thing. Looks like in general, we're doing pretty well. Uh, I'm gonna move along, right? So that we can try to get through most of this. Um, so we have this pre-processing function. It exists in our namespace, it's just being waited. Uh, we're just waiting to use it pretty much. Python's waiting for us to do something with that, right? So first what we're gonna do is create a list of stop words, right? This, this doesn't require you to fill in anything. I know there's this all caps part, but that's actually what we, what we way up here, what we uh, defined, what I defined for you, I essentially just added to our list of stops, some punctuation and some very peculiar characters that just show up in our text files, right? So this is stuff that's peculiar to our case. And depending on kind of what your use case is, you might have to add stops, that's easy. Just make a list of new stops. Right? You just type them in, figure out what they are, type them in and then add them to uh, you know, the NLTK classic English stop words, right? And we have that captured in this variable stops. Those are stop words, right? We need to now instantiate a list to hold all of our tokens because it's not just you know, one list of tokens, it's actually gonna be a list of lists, right? We're gonna have a list uh, for each blog, right? That's gonna be all the tokens for that blog and then we have one of those for each blog, right? So it's a little confusing, um, but what we're gonna wanna do is replace object here just with you know, open close brackets, right? An empty list that's gonna hold you know, the, um, the output of this for loop, right? We're gonna go ahead and iteratively add things to this list. Once we've done that, we're essentially gonna go through each one of our file strings, we're gonna um, apply our pre-processing. So this function here is just the function that we defined up here. All right, we'll go pre-process x. Make sure you spell that correctly. Python will get very angry with you if you don't. Uh, we're gonna save that in process blog, right? So we'll pre-process uh, the text and we'll make sure that we do that, right? File strs at, right, we're gonna access 
the ith element, right, go through one by one, access that element, and we're going to pre-process that using the stop words stops, right? We ask for two arguments up here. We have to give it two arguments down here, right? So we give it the string and we give it our stop words. And the only thing then to do, right, after we pre-process the blog, we'll take this pre-processed blog, um, I'm sorry, processed blog, and we'll stick it into our each blog tokens. We'll append it in, right? So this is just going to be processed blog. Pretty intuitive. We go one by one. We pre-process it. We have a processed blog post. Stick it in this list, right? It's a nice intuitive process. We've been doing the same kind of thing over and over. We have a lot of for loops, right? Because we have to do it for each blog that we're dealing with. If we go ahead and run this, we shouldn't see any output yet. All we've done is create, you know, uh, some variables uh, and then stuck things in those variables. The variables are saturated. They hold the things that we want them to. To make sure that the, everything worked correctly, uh, we have to go ahead and look at what each blog tokens holds, right? So we look at each blog tokens. We access the first element, you know, at zero, right? We're zero indexing. And we go from zero to 50. That means I want the first 50 tokens of the first blog in our blog tokens list. So if we run this, we'll see these tokens that, you know, that we had previously. We haven't done a perfect job. Um, we still have some tokens that perhaps we don't want to have, right? I don't know what these are. I don't know how they got through. Um, so we didn't do a perfect job, but we did an okay job, right? And we grabbed, we, we kind of pushed out enough of these stop words that we should still be able to kind of get uh, some good results from our analysis. I'll pause here because we did do a lot of stuff in this block, um, but, but we should see some kind of output that looks like this. If it doesn't look exactly like mine, that's fine. If it's a different blog, that's fine. As long as you get some kind of thing that looks like essentially a list of tokens, that's what we want. And definitely this part here, applying the pre-processing, a little tricky, not too bad. So as long as we got through these blocks, okay, no one is having catastrophic issues, no like, you know, absolute malfunctions with Python. It's not yelling at you too much. Uh, we have one problem. Okay, yeah. Like at some point you can, this debug, you can pause at some point. Can I, should I pause now? Sure. Okay, should I just pause and let the problem get uh, fixed? Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Um, I had a question and a quick interlude. Yeah. Um, what are some applications of natural language processing? Um, like when do people use it in real life? Yeah, so natural language processing is used for all kinds of things. Um, in particular, I think uh, some of the coolest applications are in the political sciences, right, in international relations. We have this abundance of internet, you know, Twitter data. Twitter has a really nice accessible way uh, of getting, you know, tweets. It has a nice, what we call an API app program interface uh, that will let us grab tweets uh, from Twitter. They'll give us their tweets and then we can use them for research, right? So we'll grab a lot of tweets. Uh, we'll do natural language processing, right? Because we have uh, text data and then we'll pull out some, uh, some quantitative results, right? We could have gone through and hand coded those tweets, but if we're gonna look at 100,000 tweets, it's a little clunky. So in natural language processing, it's a lot of these machine learning, you know, neural network kind of models, right, where we can start saying quantitative things uh, about data that is, you know, by nature qualitative. Uh, and that's one of the coolest things about natural language processing. So I can say, you know, how polarized uh, are the, th you know, are the things about different events. I read an article uh, just a couple weeks ago about how polarized are, um, uh, is the conversation on Twitter uh, after mass shooting, mass shootings, right? That's a very relevant topic. How do different people talk about the same events? How do, you know, uh, conservatives and liberals talk about the same events? Uh, are they, are they, you know, calling to action or are they, um, you know, just descriptively, uh, you know, uh, approaching the event? So I, I think that's a really cool application. That's a cool, that's a good question. Definitely look it up. NLP, is so applicable 
one of really, really one of the coolest uh, uh, intersections between computer science and another subject uh, and, and other subjects. So hopefully we can move along here. Uh, I want to make sure that we get to at least some of the analysis. Uh, this block, you don't need to change anything. As long as you've done everything correctly up to this point, it should just run. Um, and then output the total number of tokens in all blogs. Uh, you should get a number that's very similar or the same. If we've done that, we can move on to some simple analysis. Um, with the simple analysis, uh, I want to first uh, introduce a couple of pieces of vocab. Um, right, so we have these two words, unigram, bigram, but they're really simpler than they look. Unigram is essentially this base unit. It's, it's, it's basically the words in a sentence, right? So if we have this as a sentence, that's just a nonsense sentence. Um, oops. Unigrams would be this is a sentence, right? We have uh, these four unigrams in the sentence. What's a bigram? If we want to expand kind of our window of analysis, we'll look at two word units. Uh, and then we kind of capture a little bit more uh, information, uh, you know, in the text, right? So now we have this is, is a, a sentence, right? Instead of just this is a sentence. And we get a little bit more contextual information here. Uh, it gives us a better idea of what we're looking at. Right? So bigrams are really nice for analysis. And you can extend to uh, you know, an arbitrary amount of words. It doesn't just have to be unigram, right? One, bigram, two. You do a trigram, you do an n-gram, right? N words. Um, so anyways, unigram, bigram. Um, the first thing that we're going to do is just look at the most frequent unigrams. And essentially, we're just going to call our tokens a unigram, right? So we have this list. It's going to hold our most common unigrams. We're going to go through each blog and blog tokens. And we're going to use uh, this object called a counter object. We brought this in earlier. Essentially, it's just going to go through our tokens and count them up, right? And then we can tell, uh, we can tell uh, this counter object that we actually want the most common, right? We want the 10 most common uh, unigrams. And it's going to do all the work for us. Once we've done that, we have this little frequency uh, dictionary. Well, um, we'll stick that just in our most common list. And we'll do that for each blog, right? So we'll run that. We don't get any output. We didn't print anything yet. Um, but if we go down to this next one, we can just go ahead and see for the first blog post, what are the you know ten most common words? If there aren't ten most common words, after you know maybe it won't report that to us. Uh, but that, it's unlikely, right? We think that there would be at least ten different words. And what we see is we have what's called a tuple, right? It's a list of tuples. It's a list. We have the square brackets. The um, these uh, just parentheses indicate a tuple, right? We saw so we saw the word the 124 times. We saw the comma 109 times. We should think, uh-oh, something's gone wrong here. We didn't actually take uh, out all of the stop words here that we should have. So what I'm worried about now is that we haven't properly uh, defined our stop words. Um, I'm going to go ahead and go right up to the beginning, right? I'm going to, this is a little confusing. I think I forgot. Oh, I didn't forget to run this. Hmm. Um, All right, we had some kind of problem here with uh, putting together our stop words, uh, but that's fine. Uh, we have basically the right output. Uh, we are a little worried about the fact that punctuation got through and V and two and different words that are a little less indicative, but we do see some words that are indicative of the text, Sonoma County. Um, that's fine. And that's something to figure out maybe on your own time, you can mess around with the stop words, but let's keep moving along. Uh, and, and this is something that, uh, you know, I can correct and send back out the script so that you can follow along if you want to get something a little bit more interesting than just looking at, you know, these, these stop words. Um, let's go ahead and run this block. Nothing to change for yourself, but this is looking at all the blogs. And we do see that a lot of our stop words got through. So that's, that's a problem. Uh, but that's something that I'll fix again and send back out the script. Um, but this is really where it gets cool. Uh, you know, we looked at just the most frequent unigrams, 
but we can also look at the most frequent or the most associated bigrams. You know, what are the words that co-occurred very frequently, more frequently than we would just expect if, um, you know, if we were just looking uh, uh, at a single document, right? So that's going to get rid of our stop words, right? That's like an extra uh, level of insurance. Uh, if we just look the most frequent, we might see stop words. They happen very frequently. If we look the most associated, we're going to really start kind of start pulling out some meaningful pairs of words, bigrams. Uh, so we have a lot to replace in here. It's a complicated block, um, but we're going to start here, right? We're applying a frequency filter. We're telling uh, essentially what we're doing is telling um, this object that's pulling out our bigrams, we're telling it that we only want, you know, the X most, uh, uh, sorry, we only want bigrams that appeared at least as frequently as this number. What we choose here, you know, that's a little subjective again. Um, I'll choose three, right? Three seems like a reasonable number, but you certainly could choose different numbers here, right? But we're going to essentially say, if a bigram only happened once or twice, it's probably not that interesting. It probably just happened to happen. It isn't like, word, they aren't necessarily words that are highly associated, that we expect to see together a lot. Right, so we apply a frequency filter. Um, we go ahead and do some kind of complicated things, right? Uh, this part uh, is going to pull out the most associated. It's going to score them. And that's going to pull out the five most associated. I'm going to go ahead and round those numbers. Uh, the code looks a little complicated. It's a little intimidating, but it's really not that bad. And at the end here, we're going to go most associated, right? And we're going to append these five most associated bigrams that we pulled out. Make sure that you spell this right. I always spell associated wrong. It's a hard word to spell. Right, so we, we, we go, we went ahead, we filled in that to do, we filled in that to do. We have one more to do. Uh, this one is going to use that method that I wrote for you at the beginning, uh, which is essentially just wrapping some NLTK functionality. And we're going to pull out the most frequent five bigrams. Right, all we have to do is tell it now, what list do I want to append to? Well, it's this one up here, most F-R-E-Q, most freak, most. Right, so then we'll have lists that essentially for each blog, what are the five most associated? What are the five most frequent bigrams? If we run this, we again don't get any output. We haven't printed anything, uh, but this is really kind of the culmination. After this, we don't have that much more to do. So I'll, I'll stop here for just a moment. We are kind of pushing up against the time limit, but I'll stop here just a moment. Make sure that you added the three there. Make sure that you added the most associated there. Make sure you add the most freak there, right? The three to do's uh, in this block. This block's a little complicated. Don't get intimidated. Uh, you can look at it. I've added comments and extra explanation. You can look at it after the fact. The very last thing that we need to do is a little bit more validation, right? So let's look at our most frequent bigrams. Um, and let's look just at the first, um, just at the first blog post, you know, what is the output, right? Sonoma County happened very frequently. Here's something that we probably should have removed with stop words. It tended to co-occur with Sonoma as a bigram pretty frequently. And I'll keep this code block in view so that you can fix it if you're having trouble. Um, but uh, we kind of start seeing what are these common bigrams, right? We saw this one 43 times, right? So that's probably indicative of what the text uh, is covering, right? Something about Sonoma County. And I think this one is about wine tasting. So yeah, that makes sense. Um, we can also do this for the most associated, right? And this is a little bit more finesse method. Um, and it is a little bit more complicated. It actually uses this thing called pointwise mutual index. You can look it up. Uh, it's really a statistical technique, but it, it applies really nicely to natural language processing. Again, we're just going to subscript at zero, right? So most associated, let's check out the first blog post. What are our results? We actually see now some things that are a little different, right? Um, we've gotten rid of, you know, these associated ones that happen to have uh, a stop word in there, 
right? And we're seeing that uh, the ones that actually come through are things like Dry Creek, right? This had high association by PMI, point-wise mutual index. Pinot Noir, that makes sense. We're gonna see Pinot Noir, those two words next to each other much more frequently than we'll just see Pinot next to some random word, right? So that makes a lot of sense. We start seeing things that really kind of make sense. Promotional effort. There are these multi-word units that go together. Sorry, what was that, Claire? Can we just make a nice plot now? Yeah. So um, as long as this all worked, we should be able to save the results. We should literally just be able to run this code block, right? Run that. Make sure that this ran. Let's run this one too. We just have a little teeny bit left to go and we get that nice plot. All right. So we run this code block run this code block, that's just saving the results and we should have them uh, over in this working directory. If we refresh, we should see them right here, right? Refresh and we see them in our output. And then the last thing that we need to do is go down to making a nice plot, right? I'm rushing a little bit now so we can get to it, but let's replace this file path, right? With the right file path, which it's a little complicated because of Kaggle, but we'll go um, most frequent dot CSV, right? That's just right over here. And then we'll use this head method. That'll just show us that we have in fact pulled in the right data. We have a data frame, right? Which is just our tabular data. And we get an output that looks kind of like this, right? We see now our bigrams. We see how often they came uh, through, you know, how frequently we observed them. And we see the blog that it came from. Just some basic information. Uh, if we filled in everything right here, right, and the important thing is we fill in this thing, right, we just fill in this file path, and we make sure that we pull in the right data. If we do that correctly, then we should be able to go down here, right, tell it, I only want things um, from this very specific uh, blog, which is this blog here. You can actually just copy it, and that makes it a little easier. You don't have to spell acephalus, which is a hard word to spell, <laughs> if I'm going to be really real with you. Um, Right, and then let's make sure if we uh, output this ACEF that it actually looks like we expect it to. So let's, here's, this, here's our code block. We just have observations that happen in the blog, ACEFless in, internet, and we have these bigrams, May 2010, uh, something that should have, some punctuation that should have been removed, but it wasn't, um, but that's fine, right? The last little bit here, right? As long as we did this correctly, we put in this ACEFless internet and we uh, made sure that we had the right thing. All we do to finish up now is make a bar plot, right? We say on the y axis, we want bigram. On the x axis, right, we want this bigram column. On the x axis, we want the count. How frequently did that bigram occur? And then we can, you know, output that to our uh, output over here and save it if we'd like to. Uh, and we'll just tell it here is the file name of what I'd like to save to raise image.png. Um, that's a very kind of bland name, but it gets the job done. If we run this, we should now get a nice little bar plot, right? It shows us the count, shows us each bigram, how frequently we observed it. We can do the same thing for association. Uh, and then over here, we have image.png. We can download that if we'd like to. Um, but the, the nice point is it's really easy with Seaborn to create these nice plots and then save them with uh, this library over here is matplotlib. So that was basically the lesson. I know I had to rush through the last bit a little bit, and I know I wasn't able to follow through on the promise of uh, pulling out those uh, stop words, um, but I'll go ahead and fix that and I'll send out the script. Um, so definitely look out for the script. If you have any questions, you can stick around. We'll be around for maybe another 10 minutes, but thank you so much for coming. Uh, I'm sorry to keep you over just a little bit, but I hope you learned a little bit of something. Um, yeah, have a great rest of your evening and definitely look out for the script and any subsequent emails. We'll send out um, an email that contains uh, some feedback information so that we can make sure that we're improving with these and we're really uh, hitting on things that people are interested in. Yeah, thank you everyone for coming. Um, we're gonna have a couple more events like this this semester. We're doing a biology one that'll be pretty cool. And then we're going to have one for physics. So make sure to tell your friends and um, have a great night. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.